John Francois is going to be the subject and Jason's going to send the questions across looking at sort of uh, distribution and do's and don'ts. And then from next week, we've then got some exciting news with regards to sort of live pitching, which John Francois will go through. But from my point of view, uh, Jason, John Francois, it's for you guys to open up the sort of conversation and we'll just take it as it goes. Keep it flexible. Um, first of all, I want to start by... Uh... By saying I'm um, I'm excited to 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 be talking to you today because um, I think it's a great opportunity for me to uh, in a very short amount of time uh, give you some some facts facts from the the trenches of the world of distribution which I think it's always good to we can talk about you know by the book I think it's always better to talk about what's really happening. Um, you will you will sense uh, in in part of my discourse, if I may say that you know that I might sound pessimistic at times. I just want before I start, I want to tell you that um, hundreds of filmmakers, producers, are making a great living uh, doing what they love. So I'll give you you know I want you to keep that in the back of your head. I yes I might I might use some examples that are not. Um, uh, examples of success, um, but let's really keep in mind that uh, we all love filmmaking, and that's why we're all uh, doing what we do. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, uh, there is a way to make money, but there's also a way to make money while doing our what we love, our passion. So, you know, just don't uh, don't get stuck on some of the defeatist or pessimistic uh, example that I might give here and there. I think they're very interesting for many reasons. So um, now you can ask your question uh, that I couldn't hear, Monsieur Jason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so what are current trends in the marketplace that you're seeing right now as far as what, you know, what people are, what studios and distributors are buying and also projects that you're working on right now that, um, you can share some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges that you're working with, or maybe some of the mistakes that they made on their projects that you're having to correct uh, afterwards. All right. Still dealing with a sound problem. Jason, are you there? You can't hear me? <laughs> Not really. It's okay. As long as you can hear me, that's all. That's all I mean. Okay. Um, so, First of all, um, let me let me depict a, a a map, if you wish, of um, what the world of sales, whether it be what we call domestic market, which is the U.S. Uh, or the foreign market, let's call it the worldwide market. Uh, one thing that sometimes it's an easy it's an easy statement, but sometimes people lose lose uh, track of that. There are a, a finite number of buyers rights buyers in the world um so basically when when one is trying to sell theatrical rights as what rights video rights free television rights pay television rights ancillary rights or all rights to those buyers um basically once all of them are aware of the of the project and uh, you know they they let's let's put it this way that nobody none of them want um, want uh, that that film. Well, you know we have a problem because basically that means um, the 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 film will not be seen by anybody in the world, including the U.S. If a buyer buys the rights for that territory and releases the film on whatever platform it desires to. Now, there's a little bit of a change in the sense that, um, re you know, recently uh, it is possible to, ac to access um, John Francois, can you jump uh, your camera yourself. back on? I know. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm having technical difficulties. Hold on one second. <laughs> it's always like that. Last time I poured some orange juice. Now today it's not working. I mean, hold on. I try again. Uh, can you see me? There we go. Yes, yes, we yeah. see you. All right. I still can already hear you, but as long as you can hear me. So what I'm saying is basically there's a finite amount of buyers in the world. So, so 
you need to keep in mind that you want some of those buyers to buy your film or the rights to your film for a territory. Otherwise, it will not, never be seen by audiences. And sometimes filmmakers, it's a very easy uh, thing to understand, but I just, I'm just putting it there because uh, some filmmakers forget that that's the way it works. So, and buyers, I like to call them as the, you know, the, the barriers, the barriers to the territory. You, you cannot enter uh, distribution in a territory if any of those buyers do not buy your film. So keep that always in the, in the back of your head. So, you know, how many, want how to many, please the buyers. How many buyers Hello? do you generally have in a marketplace? Like for, let's say for France. Uh, France, France, uh, I would say a dozen all rights buyers, mm. um, maybe 20 to 30 SVOD buyers. Um, and then, uh, when it comes to television, uh, a lot because, uh, France has what they call a bouquet, uh, a digital bouquet of offering of channels, you know, depending on different channels where one, one company will offer, you know, uh, topical channels, like 50 of them, you know, one about home and gardening, one of them about, you know, environment, one about the ocean. So, so probably hundred, hundreds of, uh, of free television and pay television uh, channels, but you can see that's a big territory, friends. And we're looking at what, if you, if you do the math, maybe 200 buyers total, you know, uh, Okay, so once they all have uh, passed on your film, you can say goodbye to France. It's kind of my message, okay? And it's very important I'm saying this, that you keep this in the back of your head. So let me, let me tell you, uh, uh, since we're talking about live from the trenches, I'm going to use some films that um, I've, I have handled sales for and some of them that I'm still handling sales for. for. Um, I will not give you the titles. I'll describe what they are and tell you uh, what has happened for, for those. Um, I'll start with um, a documentary. So filmmakers, just listen to it. Imagine that's you. A documentary uh, produced and directed by a professional photographer who lives in Guatemala. Very talented man. Um, managed to get this idea that he wanted to be the first one to cover uh, and find and shoot and shoot um, a, a sacred bird in Latin America called the Quetzal. The Quetzal is uh, the most uh, worshipped bird in Latin America for the past thousand years to the point where if you go to some of the temples there, um, whether Incas, Mayas or whatever, you will see sculptures of the Quetzal, with a, which is basically the feathered serpent, which is a, a, a beautiful bird with a gigantic, a gigantic tail. And obviously, because of the problem of deforestation that's happening there, um, this gorgeous bird is in trouble. And uh, that is what he wanted to do. He wanted to talk, he wanted to cover this. And he spent about three years shooting this. Um, he raised uh, 120,000 US dollars, uh, which he got one check for. And he got it from the CEO of one of the Latin American airlines, the, um, uh, an airline called Volaris, Volaris, which is a small airline over there. So, of course, for them, uh, $120,000 is not a lot of money, especially for all the marketing that they hope they would get uh, by being an airline that cares about deforestation, that cares about environment, all that. So that's all good. So he got his arm with the $120,000, spent about two and a half years shooting uh, a documentary. Um, when I got involved, the documentary was uh, put together. It was in Spanish with a Spanish narration and uh, gorgeous, gorgeous images and, and, and a very clever way of editing the film. So that's kind of the product. Um, I, I took it, if I may say, or, or decided to, to work with him, uh, which by the way, work with him uh, the true media company way, which is a different way. And we'll talk about that later uh, than a typical sales agency agreement. And um, I just told him that, you know, this was a difficult because number one, the language, um, and uh, I was not sure that uh, people in the world would care about this uh, Quetzal and, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, maybe people didn't care about the problem of deforestation and all this. Um, so that was, about a, that was about two years ago. So indeed, it was difficult. Uh, indeed, uh, many buyers 
of different rights uh, passed on it. Some of them did not even respond. Um, but I kept going on, kept, kept pushing as much as I could, you know. Uh, uh, I, I knew, of course, uh, uh, some buyers personally where I can call in some uh, territories and discuss with them, what are you buying, what are you looking for? And um, today, so about uh, 18 months later, uh, you know, uh, we had we had not made one sale of this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, piece. And you know, if you guys are interested later, whatever, I can always show you the trailer and everything. And all of a sudden, by by pushing and pushing, and pushing, I got uh, this in front of the acquisition team of a very, very distinguished channel in France called Arte. A R T E. Arte is a, a French channel, but it's also a German channel. It's French and German. So basically, you have to relinquish free television rights for both territories for a three-year three term. And uh, usually, they ask for two airings, two broadcasts. That's it. So that's what you're selling. You're selling two broadcasts for three years for the territories of France and Germany. Um, they liked what they saw, and they said, but, but your film is a feature length documentary. It was 90 minutes. And they said, we cannot do anything with this because, you know, right. we're a TV channel and uh, we, need, uh, we need to squeeze it in the grid and the grid is 52 minutes. So it was interesting that I went back to my uh, crazy director, Ricky and everything. And Ricky has no money whatsoever. Okay. No <laughs> means whatsoever. And I said, well, listen, you could be uh, the director of a film that airs on RT. It's a very distinguished thing. And, and you know, you could make 25,000 euros. Okay. Now, 25,000 euros for one sale. Remember, the budget is 120 US. It's not bad at all, you know. Okay. Uh, but I said, there's a but. Um, you, need, uh, you need to come up with a 52 minutes of your 90 minute uh, feature length. Oh. He, he, he understood, <laughs> not at first, but. I convinced him and uh, went back to his friends over there in Me actually in Mexico City, where he has a post-production company that he knows some friends there, and they cut a 52 minute. And uh, hallelujah, uh, a sale was made. So that's one example, okay? And and it's it's important to know the power of one territory sale, okay, for a small budget film. Now, granted, it's a documentary. I know it's not a, fic a fiction film or anything. All right, let's let me s skip quickly to another uh, real life example. What? Wait, wait, wait uh, one sec, one second, one second. How could they have made the documentary more valuable? Is hmm. it? Did they have any? Did they have any um, attachments, or could they have gotten a, a famous, um, you know, uh, a, uh, actor from you know from Mexico to narrate? Well, or? Uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, Ricky, the director, actually managed to have uh, as one of the interviewees in the film, as well as the music uh, of the end credits, a basically the equivalent of uh, Bono for Latin America, and his name oh, is wow. uh, okay. for Silva, Silva something, and he's, he's amazing. He got fifty million fifty million followers in Latin America, so he got that. Now. It did not help outside of Latin America. But granted, if you listen to what I just said, this film, as, as we're talking about it right now, is still not sold in Latin America. So I'm telling you, it's, it's really tough. Wow. So let me go quickly for the sake of uh, speed. Sorry, uh, let's skip now to... Sorry. Can you, can no, you guys hear me? Sorry. Did they dub it into French? I cannot hear. This is awful. Did they dub it into did French? Did they dub it into French or did they give it subtitles? Uh, good question. They they will uh, they will dub uh, the narration in French. Yeah. Thank you. Indeed, and but they cover they cover the cost the cost for that. Um, so now let's go. It's so that's one hundred twenty. It's eleven twenty right film. now. Say what? It's eleven twenty right now. Just for okay. Well, I'll go quickly then. Um, no, 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 no. So, Take your time. Take your time. So then, um, you know, it's driving me nuts that I can. Hold on, I gotta solve this somehow. Hold on. Hold on one second. Hold on one second, please. Technical difficulties. I hit that. Let me see. Well, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, I think I know. I know what happened. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. These you guys, hold on one second. All right, so that was a hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollar budget. Now let's skip to a documentary, a beautiful documentary again, feature length, uh, which cost eight million dollars, which I've been working with. Um, uh, that film um, was uh, made in three D. Took about two and a half years to make. Was shot in about four different uh, locations in the world. Gorgeous, from the Fiji Island to the uh, Sea of Cortez and everything. And the uh, director was a guy named uh, Jean Michel Cousteau, the son of Jacques Cousteau. And when I got in, two weeks after I got involved with this film, uh, we had uh, Monsieur Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, go all in with us uh, to basically introduce the film, to be the one that's on screen at the beginning of the film, and to co-narrate the feature film uh, alongside uh, the French accent of Jean Michel Cousteau. Eight million dollar film. This is the real deal. This is gorgeous. Um, there was a sales agent attached to that film when I got involved. I know that guy. Actually, he's a friend of mine. I'm not crazy about, again, uh, the way he does business, you know, the old sales agency model. I'll talk about that later. Um, but I do like him a lot. He went with this. Now, the, the producers who are French, of course, wanted to do a theatrical release as many places as they could, including the U.S., um, in the U.S., uh, these, these French producers had sold a beautiful documentary many years before to the head of Disney. And that head of Disney became, as of today, still the CEO of Cinemark, uh, one of the exhibitors in the U.S. Okay, you heard of Cinemark, guys, right? AMC, yeah. Cinemark, and all that. And uh, they, so, they, you know, they, they, they pulled the, the you know, uh, we're friends, let's do something together. And... And that's where, where basically you realize the difficulty of releasing anything theatrically in the U.S. Uh, the deal was never made. The only thing they could put together was a Fathom release. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Fathom, F-A-T-H-O-M, which is a one screening uh, nationwide um, uh, release. And uh, they thought it was a great way to do this, uh, to kind of see wh- which, which territories in America would respond well to the film. It did not generate a lot of money. Got some intel as to where people, you know, funny, like people in San Francisco loved it and everything, you know. Got some intel about distribution for the U.S. The film was never released theatrically. Why is that? Now, in terms of foreign market with such a, a, a heavy vehicle of uh, 7 or $8 million with, uh, with the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger attached to it, um, the film sold in a few territories, not for a lot of money. Uh, and um, the only... The only success that happened with this film has to do with me and my prior Chinese partner, where we went to Beijing and uh, she pitched the film without showing the buyer anything, just saying that Arnold Schwarzenegger was in it. Uh, we came back from uh, Beijing, from our trip to China, we came back and they made an offer for, to release the film theatrically in China. And the minimum guarantee that they were offering was uh, five times the total amount of all the sales made worldwide <laughs> outside of China. So, so you know, oh, those no. are weird things. Those are weird things, but but this is this is really what's happening. You know, uh, you know, China is another topic we can talk about later. So, so not that great a success. You know, eight million dollars. Will will the investors uh, make their money back? Never. Okay. Uh, will the investor? In the prior documentary I told you about with $120,000, will, will, will he make his money back? Could be, okay? So anyway, now let me quickly switch um, to a, a, well, I could, I could talk, uh, there's another documentary about an island in the talk about Island. Talk about a feature. Of, a I'm going to talk about a feature. I'm going to get out of documentaries. Yeah, so the features, I want to say two things. Um, I want to talk, I want to go back in time a little bit and give you a real example. And I don't know if any of you have seen this movie. You guys know Keanu Reeves. And Keanu Reeves, several years ago, made a movie that I was involved with for distribution called The Watcher. He plays a killer. And uh, you're looking at the time, you're looking at seven or eight million dollar budget. Um, uh, I need to tell you a story about this film because I think it's interesting, even if it takes a little time. Uh, the film was shot uh, by a director who had only uh, directed a video, a music, vi- music video before. 
why did that guy get the, the gig of being a director of a seven million or eight million dollar movie with Keanu Reeves? It's because he was the bass player in Keanu Reeves' uh, band, and they used to smoke jo joints together. Okay, <laughs> and so th so there's not much. Uh, so yeah. everybody was happy. They started to shoot. Uh, when it came when it came time to look at the uh, you know the first cuts of the film, uh, the production and distribution company I was working with uh, panicked because it was an absolute piece of uh, you know what and um, so what to do what to do now so this is one of my favorite stories and it's a true story uh, this very uh, hip dude smoking joint friend of Kinu was editing the film yeah. in, uh, in, during post-production. Uh, a friend of mine who I was working for that company, and Jason, you know him, it's Clark, uh, yeah. went, went to the editing room with a gift, uh, which was, a, at the time, the latest video game console. I don't know which one it was, you know, at the time. And there, I talked to the director and said, you know what, man, you have worked so hard, you're probably so mm -hmm. tired, uh, why don't you take a break and look, 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 look at that. We got you this, this, your favorite video game console. The guy just went, oh, dude, this is fantastic. Left. Then uh, the, the company took, took over the, the, the production of the film. They went to Chicago, spent another million dollars. Pretty much we shot about 40% of the film. And the film is the film that you can watch if you rent The Watcher, which was it's not a great film, but it's much better than the first cut by wow. Kinu's, um, you know, music buddy. So I thought that was cool. Uh, in terms of distribution, that was years ago, I know. Uh, but that's the kind of film at the time, the before Netflix time, where the $7 million uh, was recouped and profit, a lot of profit was made by selling this, selling this film in the U.S. and the rest of the world. I'm talking a lot of profit, a lot of money, Okay. It would be interesting to see a, a film like The Watcher, how it would happen, you know, what would happen with it today. Anyway, so going back to today, because you asked me what's going on today in the world play, in a distribution marketplace. Um, Jason, I want to use quickly, because I had a wonderful uh, um, talk this morning with a, a young Frenchman, uh, Gita knows who he is, uh, Benjamin. Benjamin is 29 years old. Two years ago at 27, uh, he managed to become the director of a $2 million film with uh, William Baldwin and Michael Madsen. Uh, you guys, you're welcome to go see it if you want. It's on Amazon. It's called Two Graves in the Desert. And it's not a bad, it's not a bad film. And um, I talked to him uh, about it this morning, um, congratulating him on the job that he had done. So this one is interesting. Let's switch, let's switch to distribution. Uh, roughly $2 million U.S., uh, Michael Madsen, uh, William Baldwin, you know, both of them, I think they shot for eight days, eight shooting days. Um, the film is about uh, uh, a man and a woman who are taken uh, prisoners in the trunk of a van or a truck. And it's all happening in the truck. And uh, because, uh, you know, William Baldwin and Michael Madsen are the bad guys and they're probably going to take them to the desert to shoot them. That's basically the film. Um, in terms of the U.S. distribution, Straight to Amazon, revenue sharing. It's, it's basically on a prayer, cross your fingers, how many clicks are going to happen. Uh, Amazon keeps a lot of, uh, of the revenues. It's a typical revenue, the click, the click business, which I hate. You know what I mean? Because, uh, it, you know, it's kind of throwing, it's, you, I, you have as many chances to go to Vegas and win. And because there's so many films, uh, you know, you compete against so many other products. Uh, Foreign-wise, it's, it's been sold in about, uh, I think, all the European countries, some of them in Latin America, but that's kind of a life from the trenches. You have to understand that uh, these, the French, the German, the, the Spanish, you know, from Spain, will not pay more for all rights, for 10 years or 15 years license, will not pay more for this type of film today than 20 or 25,000 US. Wow. So, yeah. It was sold. Uh, I am not uh, a fan of the sales agent, by the way, but that's another story. And, but do, let's do the math together, you know? Amazon, it's going to be revenue share. Whatever comes, whatever comes, we don't know, okay? Uh, rest of the world, 20, 30, 40, uh, 25, 10, 5,000, you know, Malaysia. Uh, you still have $2, you have $2 million budget to recoup. 
how does that sound to you? You know, if Horrible. you put your, your, your business cap. So yeah. that's today. That's today. And that's with two names. Not great names, but two names for two million. Okay? So that's one. Um, red, red, flags, uh, just, red, red, red flags on the, on the sales agreement. We should, we should uh, dip into that. Well, yeah. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, as we're speaking right now, the director of the film, who actually invested some money in his own film, does never not do know. that. Never do that, by the way. If that, you, can, never if do that you, can, if yeah. you can't, no. Never, don't invest that. in your own film. Okay. So this, <laughs> he, he today has no idea where the film has been sold, for how much. He got no report. No reporting. Okay. Is that, Those are, is that Ben who's in the call? Is Ben here with us, I think? There's a Ben in this call. No, 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 no. It's another Ben. It's a Benjamin. Oh. It's a French Benjamin. Gita, oh, okay. I think Gita is the only one who knows him here. In, in I was going to say, because there's a Ben in the call. Okay, carry on. Yeah, Sorry, no. Ben. No, it's not that Ben. <laughs> All right. So this is it. So basically, um, to, to conclude uh, on that part, if I can, um, yesterday, the days before Netflix compared to the days after Netflix from a distribution standpoint. The days before Netflix was, you were searching, every, everybody was trying to get an all right deals from different territories. The money was good because the different distributors in those big territories would do their best to recoup their MG from releasing theatrically, from releasing to video. My, DVD was still kind of alive, by the way, at that time, it was a huge, a huge part of the revenues. Pay television, free television, if they have a nice contract by which they cross collateralize all those rights and recoup the expenses, it was a good, deed, a good deal for both the seller and the buyer. That's pre-Netflix. Post-Netflix, welcome to the world of streaming and SVOD being the engine. Uh, it's, it's all chamble, it, it's, all, it's all different. Um, uh, Netflix and some other platforms, if you're so lucky that they will buy uh, either the US from you or maybe the world or maybe some uh, foreign territories, number one, it will be a flat deal. And you guys know the difference between a minimum guarantee and a flat deal, which means that you'll see X amount of dollars, you won't see $1 more. That's it. You know, Netflix tells you, listen, I'm going to give you, I don't know, 20000 uh, for for a small movie. Uh, for 10 years or whatever, or, or uh, in the big, the big cases, you know, I'm going to give you uh, $25 million for your film and uh, you'll, you'll never see another dollar. So, so you know, if, you're, if you come out of Sundance and you're a hot product out of Sundance or Berlin, whatever, Netflix wants it for some reason, and this is a film that you made for $15 million and Netflix offers you $20 million for the world forever, pretty much, what do you do? You take it. You're, you're one of the few movies that will have made $5 million benefit, uh, profit. You know what I mean? It's kind of a, it's an interesting math. It, it, it's just completely different than the pre-Netflix uh, uh, lay of the land. So that's, uh, now there's one film I, I, I would love to talk about, but I can't. And that, me, that I will um, uh, myself find out from Intel is, and I think it will be a good, a happy ending story, is uh, Jedis and Robin's last movie. I think it's very interesting. This is a movie they made, and I won't say anything about it, but I have a good feeling about it. I hope. Jedi and uh, Robin, you hope too, right? We, we hope there. that. We're here. <laughs> yeah, it's going. We're, we're ple very pleased so far. Our Perfect. expectations have been met, definitely. Perfect. You see, guys? Okay, that's why I wanted to bring you bring you this example, you know? And we can say what it is, right, JD? Home sweet home, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. out. It's on Amazon Prime, and uh, it's launching I, on I, another I, new channel uh, this month, actually. Perfect. TV. So, but yeah, Amazon, Amazon and iTunes and even YouTube for, for rent and, and sale. Bravo. bravo, 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 bravo. So this is it for, for that part of your question. Uh, sorry, it was a long answer, uh, Monsieur uh, Jason. <laughs> We'd expect nothing John, less. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, John, John Francois, we're at we're at 1134, and we haven't got to the second question. So can uh, sales... Well, hit me with the second... What, what, are, uh, what, are, what, yeah. are, what are the red flags on the sales agreements? 
like your the big okay well that's gonna be that's gonna be quick that's gonna be quick okay so you guys let's say you have a film let's it's the wrong example but let's say you just finished producing a film and you're looking for a sales agent obviously you've heard me before repeat and repeat and repeat that you know somehow you should either um, get married with a sales agent or a producer rep before the film is finished that, that we talked about that a little bit but for the sake of example your film is finished you're shopping for a sales agent that's going to sell the rights of your film to the to the world the first the first thing is check who they are check who they are so they are basically the world of sales agent i'm, I'm going to stay in the u.s uh you have a combination of uh, guys who've done it for many 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 years and are still alive which could be a a good a good news but sometimes it's not because they maybe they're still alive because they've taken advantage of so many producers that they're still alive producers never made a, a dollar but that's an, another thing so check who they are is it a new company is it an old company uh very important the first thing you do is you you try to find on the internet what films are they representing today or they've represented in the past once you you look at that stuff locate it's not hard locate the producers of some of those films Try to get a phone number or something and get in touch from filmmaker to filmmaker saying, hey, listen, I'm thinking about using company X to be the sales agent to my film. It, it looks like they've been handling one of your film. What was your experience like? That's the first thing to do. And I presume 80% uh, of the time you're going you're gonna to have some horror stories. The good thing is, then you can make your choice. You can, <laughs> then you can, you can go and ask, do the same thing with somebody else. Okay. In terms of the contract itself, quickly, um, um, how many years term? How many years do they want to be the sales agent for your film? They should not want to be the sales agent for your film for more than two or three years. Now, I swear to you, I know it. Some of them will hit you with, uh, you know what, uh, we're getting inv invested in here, da 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 They're going to ask you for 10, 10 or, or 12 years. Now, if you sign an agreement by which you, you relinquish the rights to sell, all rights to sell worldwide to your film, to a sales agent for 10 or 15 years, what you've done, if you have allowed that company to, to tell the world that they own your film and that your film is part of their library, Listen to what I just said, because it's very important. Uh, a lot of those sales agents are in the, I call it the tomato business, meaning that they're not selling one film in the, in the markets or whatever. They're selling bags of tomatoes, okay? And you just happen, your film just happened to be a tomato. They have old tomatoes. They have rotten tomatoes. They have some great ones, freshly, freshly picked from the fields. This is what they do, okay? And it allows them to basically do package deal. Package deal is not a good thing usually because basically you're going to say to the buyer, listen, I got 12 films you seem to like. I'm selling you those 12 films, okay? We're going to work the, the deal. I'll send you a deal memo and an agreement. What the sales agent, the first thing they're going to do because they're smart, they're going to go back to their sales agency agreement with the different films. They're going to look at the now the commission. So, you know, they're going to look, okay, so on this film, we have 20% 20, 20 commission. On this one, we have 25. On this one, we have 30. On this one, we have 35. And what they're going to do is take the, the purchase pray, price for that package of 10 movies and allocate the most money to the one where they have the most commission. It's math. Does it have, does it have anything to do with the quality of your film compared to the other one they're selling? No. It's pure math. It's pure math. Uh, business which is not a business that will serve you as a filmmaker they're not really serving your film okay so that's one thing so how many years try to keep it to two years three max permission i mean if you come to them with a gem with uh, some stars attached or thing and a significant budget you know what um, they will actually the good ones the good sales agent will it is pretty much standard they'll they'll get like between 15 and top 20 Okay, uh, if you come with a, a film that is maybe hard to sell for some reason, there's nobody in the movie and they don't know, but they're going to give it a try, blah, blah, blah. They're going to ask you 30, 30, up to 30 or 35 percent. Okay, uh, the, the what I call the Bermuda Triangle, why I always, always, even though I come from more than 20 years being in this business, I always detest uh, the sales agency agreement the boilerplate is the, the term in it 
which is, has to do with expenses. It's actually called recoupable expenses. That mm. is the Bermuda Triangle. This is where hundreds, hundreds of producers, I can name names, I can name names of movies, everything. I've never seen a dollar where actually their films were sold around the world. It's that recoupable expense term of the contract. It's very, very dangerous. Now, you this know, is, this, is, this is the Harvey Weinstein model, correct? It's a Harvey Weinstein. It's a Harvey Lerner. It's a many, many others. Anyway, um, it makes sense. When they pitch it to you, it makes sense. They're saying, you know what? We're going to go to all the markets. It's going to cost a lot of money and everything. Oh, hell yes. I don't know if you guys have been to the Cannes Film Festival and you went to the Majestic and ordered an espresso. It's 10 euros. It's very expensive to go there, you know, during the market. Everything is expensive. So the problem is because they, they, they enter into such deals with not only you, but with as many producers as they can, and they do the same deal, they end up having a total of recoupable expenses, which makes them recoup every expensive coffee, dinner, whiskey, uh, uh, air fl- air, airfare, you know, whatever, everything you are paying for them to have a grand time at a market. <laughs> so, so that's why be, be always very careful and, and be very careful about uh, when they start talking about expenses and, and, and fight for it, you know, put a lawyer on or put somebody like uh, me and Jason there behind you, whatever, as your bodyguards, whatever. Um, but I would say, um, I would say the final thing is, you know, I, I believe strongly in the human element and uh, when you meet those, you know, don't, don't do the, the deal over the phone if you can. If you meet the, the, the sales guy, uh, the sales lady, uh, face-to-face, you'll, you'll have also a, a feeling there. If you feel comfortable and the, the terms of the agreement make sense, go for it. Uh, True Media Company, as an example, or me, when I represent films, I do not do any of those things. That will be that will be for another another uh, another session. That's it for that. Okay. Jesse? So, what are the uh, the biggest pitfalls that people that filmmakers make with their films bef- when they're even starting out, so that it messes them up for later? Three, and then we're done. Then we can go and uh, <laughs> ask questions and all that. I, I'm I'm done talking. First one is, as you are working on the budget of your film, even at the early stages, please, please, please start including as a budget item, marketing and distribution cost. Please, I beg of you. Uh, It's too late when you spend the last dollar on post-production and you never kept any money for marketing and distribution. It's too late. And then, then you had the mercy of, the, the people, you know, the animals I just finished talking about. So distribution, ex- marketing and distribution expenses, allocate something as a budget item in your budget, please. Number two. Um, that should that I, briefly, sorry, include film festival submission as well, because a lot of people. Yes, come yes, yes say, exactly. Those are not the most expensive, but hell yes. You're right, Dan. You're right. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, just 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 put on the budget, uh, you know, the fee for uh, Fusion International Film Festival. You don't. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Number two, um, as you get to to the point of uh, post production, and sometimes I've seen it, uh, people uh, arrive at that stage and they they spend all their money. They don't have much money left for post. Uh, please, the importance of asking around what a typical buyer, whether it be from the US or from uh, the rest of the world, what are the list to put your hands on the list of deliverables that a buyer will, requ- will request. It's very important. Um, I just, I think, I, I don't know if I told you, if I go back to the very beginning of today, I told you with my 120,000 documentary about the Quetzal, my poor Ricky had to go back to the post-production, not only because he had to reduce his feature film to a 52-minute uh, uh, programming. On top of that, he had to find $3,500, which is a lot of money for him, to actually create some of the deliverable elements that Arte is requiring. If you don't have them, there's no deal. So always, always uh, try to, to allocate some money that you, you know you're going to be able to, 
to cover the, the, the creation of uh, all the deliverables that a big broadcast, uh, a broadcaster asks for. Uh, the last one, go back to what I just said before, is as before, before you finish the film, start looking around for a good sales agent or distribution person, lady or guy or whatever that you can actually start to work early on talking about matters of distribution before your film is completed, please, please, please. That's it. You know, so I ended up, I ended up my talk with uh, begging you to do something. Please, please, please. <laughs> John Francois, would you be saying to people about, think about the content they're making before they even start with its viability? And it's always that balance of do what you love, um, but also match it with commercial viability. Is that still the same for you right now? Even if see the current climate, people need to still create projects that have that chance of distribution as opposed to a passion project. Passion projects are great, but you ne maybe need to take that realisation that it may not go as far as they think because they can love it, but someone else might not buy into it. I know that's the same with every film, but you have a good idea of what's commercial and what's not. Dan, that's why I love you. You know what I mean? You just, you just explained something very, very important. And it, it, it's, it's not even like you ask a question. What you said is correct. Uh, the only thing I would say is, as, you know, when you're at an early stage, like at a, screen, a screenplay level, uh, you know, early packaging for early uh, search of a director or actors and all that, I never want to say to a filmmaker, uh, do not follow your vision because... Uh, some of the most successful uh, filmmakers have done that and done very well, okay? Um, I just ask that somehow, in the back of their head, they ask themselves the question that you just ask. That's all. You know, uh, it's a must. Because so many, I mean, I, I swear, 98% of filmmakers do not even ask themselves or think about uh, what's going to happen in the future when it comes to distribution. It's not even in their radar at all. And they finish the film, they celebrate, and then they have a hard awakening the next morning because they're discovering that uh, there's a business there and the investor is going to want his money back most of the time. Yeah. Fantastic. I think, uh, um, go, well, Tracy. Well, I would just say one, one thing about uh, anybody that has not gone to like a film market, even though we have AFM here, it, it, you know, you... It's, it's important that you check it out because you'll go and you'll see all these films that people have with names that, that are there. So you can just see how oversaturated the marketplace is to get a vibe of, um, you know, how is your film going to do? So you, you got to make your film, you have to make your film stand out um, against all the other, you know, all the other ponies at the show. So, otherwise, otherwise it will be a tomato. Yeah, it's going to be a tomato. Yeah, yep. and and even even with horror films right now, because did a horror film, we had some you know B stars in our film and thought it was going to be easy to sell. We even had Sony do distribution on it, and even with that, our I have not received any paperwork in regards to current sales, and it's a it's a total it's a disaster. Uh, and so you invested, it uh, Jason, you invested in the film. Oh, I invested too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're, le we're learning together. You know, we do all the mistakes too, you know, uh, oh, especially as a, film, as a filmmaker. And would you also say one other thing, um, would you also say is if you're a documentary filmmaker, the don't do a feature, do definitely do for TV or, or shorter like TV, yes, like yes, Netflix? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's, that's uh, documentary features. I, I, are I, I, I think I, I think I made a, a strong case for it. It's not unique. It's it's really if you want to make a documentary, please uh, uh, make it a make make it a one hour, you know. So it's a nice yeah. one hour full pack documentary, interesting that can go on SVOD and be part of the grids of all the the free television channels around the world. Oh hell yes, hell yes! It is so I know <laughs> it's so hard to sell a feature length documentary. Very very hard. John Francois, with reference to the deliverables, so um, one of our filmmakers, he had a project with us, which was a documentary, got picked up by one of the distributors that joined us. He was then taking it to Cannes as they were looking to get it into different territories. And he said the toughest thing was the deliverables. He was naive. He never knew they existed when he was a young sort of filmmaker doing it. Um, 
Are deliverables similar across the board or do they change? I mean, I've got a few in my inbox for a few companies, sales agents that we know. They've sent me what they ask for. Is it generic or generic? It, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, it's generic. And, you know, it includes, well, let's call it, you know, the basics. You know, you have basics, you know, like, uh, uh, um, you know, don't forget to create a separate uh, music and effect track, you know, because, here, again, American filmmaker is like, uh, what do you mean, uh, separate music and effect track? Well, your film, if it needs to be dubbed, <laughs> you're going to have to add that. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about it. Okay, boom, uh, four grand later, you know, $4,000 later or whatever, depending on what house they go to. Yeah, you have basics and, yeah, you know, it goes all the way to uh, key art and, and, you know, and the good Rushes thing, guys. And everything. Yeah, Dan, the, the beautiful thing, of course, is, you know, because I always like to bring back the old times. <laughs> the old times was nuts when it came to deliverables because, you know, we were on the, uh, at the time of the, do you guys, some of you might remember the one inch and TSC masters. Do you remember those good things? I mean, they were that, I mean, they were that big, you know, uh, the Bedak MSP was a little smaller, you know, and you had to ship all this. You had to ship all this, you know, and I'm not even getting into 35 mini bit of print because that's an absolute disaster. The stories that I have about the filmmaker showing up with his uh, five reel or 35 millimeter in can and, you know, one was stuck at the customs, couldn't do the screen. I mean, blah, blah, blah. Today, the beautiful thing is, you know, you're talking DCPs, you're talking digital, digital you know, uh, click on that link and you got all the deliverable. It's, you know, it's, things have changed to the, to, to, to the best than, you know, it's much, much, much less difficult today. Much, much, much easier. Fantastic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, I think we'll say run a little bit over, but I'd like to open it up if anyone's got any questions to jump in and have a chat. I got a, I got a quick question. This is yeah. for um, actually uh, Jason and John Francois. So, you know, you, you talked a lot about um, kind of sales agency and distribution, and you mentioned like Amazon has like the, you know, the revenue sharing. And uh, Jason, you mentioned like AFM. Now, I've been to AFM a, a couple years ago and got to kind of experience that um, weird magical nightmare. Uh, and it's so, <laughs> yeah. it's horrible. So, you know, with this sort of the scenario that we're kind of in now, you know, where do you see? Like, are there distribution, like, is, is it possible to, what, what, let me see if I can actually ask a, ask a question. Uh, is it possible to actually create a business deal for a low sort of uh, budget movie and be, have it be profitable in a way? Like, I, I, I get the sense that everything now, because there is so many sort of streaming services and things that just buy these movies in bulk, um, I sort of get the impression that, it's, you know, is it all these sort of flat deals of, of you know, is this the hope that you get Amazon or you get all these other places that just give you these revenue sharing and then you make your money internationally? Is that still sort of the model or is there a chance domestically to make money as well? I mean, I'm not, I'm not even talking theatrically. I'm talking just, just simply digitally. Jason, you want to answer or you want me to answer? Sure, I can. I can. It's... You know, now, I mean, it, it was hard before. I mean, even even three years ago when, so I did a movie called I'll See You in My Dreams. That's like the hero darling of every, I mean, of what the filmmaker wants to do. We made it for under a million. We, we actually still needed 40,000 to get into Sundance to do all the deliverables and get everything done. But that did a three run, uh, three month run in the theater it made seven and a half million dollars in the theaters. Obviously we don't get the whole seven and a half because the theater's taken half. And, and then also you take in the, the, the P and a off of that, but it made an additional seven and a half million overseas. And we had universal doing the uh, bleaker street did domestic um, universal did the, the, the foreign and it's made about $15 million on a million dollar film. Now, now, um, Fast forward to The Rake. I made The Rake one year later, which is a horror film. We made The, the Rake for under $200,000. You can see, I mean, and if you look at the film, I mean, it's, uh, it, it doesn't look like that, you know, that low of a budget. But with that, we felt horror, you know, horror is a strong, um, you know, you can't, you can't make enough horror films because they want them so much. But even that, even now, with with that, it's the the horror films are a little bit oversaturated, and 
it's a buyer's market, unfortunately, meaning they are going to lowball you on, on your film. So it's, it's, it's challenging. You get, you're going to have to find filmmakers are going to have to find other ways to market their films, to, to get it out there, use social media, um, any, anything possible to have that film break out in this marketplace right now. It's, uh, I can add, Brad, I'll add, he's absolutely, absolutely correct. Uh, if we're talking about today, um, at whatever, at whatever budget level you, you, you're talking about, uh, what needs to be accomplished, which is very, very hard, Brad, is, um, is to, to put as much sellable talent or a sellable genre or a sellable, a wonderful script, put all this, cram it in the least amount of money in terms of budget. This is what it is. Uh, Jason knows we, we're working with one of the major five studios right now. And, and basically, you know, you, you show up with a $6 million budget film and they want you to have at least two A, A list, A list name. In it. That's six mil. You know, and uh, so, you know, we're lucky. We're working on one uh, great producer, managed to put, you know, uh, Anthony Hopkins, Ellen Hunt, and Betty Ciro Toro in a 6.8. 6 it might fly. You see, but you see how difficult what I just said, Brad? You see? And it's the same as you go lower in budget. You know what I mean? It gets actually even more difficult, obviously. But, and that's what you have to accomplish nowadays in today's marketplace. As far as streaming, I've also heard that Tubi is a good um, is a good platform to make money on. Um, I have a friend who has his uh, he has his movie on there, and he's getting he's making good money on that. Um, Tubi, no, uh, no, Tubi, T U B I, oh, Tubi. Okay. Tubi, yeah, yeah. I, actually, it's funny. I, I um, so my last movie that I did is on both Tubi and okay. Amazon and a few other platforms. And it's funny to see uh, sort of over the last couple of years, Amazon, the revenue from Amazon has been slowly going down, but the revenue right. from Tubi has been going up. There you go. Weirdly you enough. Go. Yeah. 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 Nice. I think it's, it's also, it's just com competition, right? I mean, like, I don't know how many films are on Tubi, but how many films are on Amazon? It's like, you're competing. What are you competing against on Amazon? Like all the bit, you know, everybody big. So again, it's, it, it depends on the distributor. Like Bleecker Street for our film was incredible. They knew how to market our film. They had worked with focus features that, and, and they just knew how to hit target certain markets. But, but even as of a year ago, a lot of the, you know, the, the, the theatrical Hollywood was scared to death about theatrical and then COVID hits. So, um, you know, and they haven't come up with something that is the, you know, the, the, the experience yet that, um, that we want, we want, you know, we, an audience, uh, to, to see something to that, that, that is going to replace potentially a theater. And, and that's, that's the challenge out there. And Brad, I'll add one more last thing from my side. Uh, you know, since you remember, I'm always the pessimistic one. I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to be, I'm going to bring you some, uh, some hope, uh, low budget horror film well done by you you know uh when it comes to the foreign marketplace um in some of the major territories as well as small small territories such as indonesia malaysia and all thailand and all that stuff uh there are buyers that's that basically specialize that's all they do in your genre those buyers will pay you if, if you've done a good job according to them they will give you an mg for all rights in their territory which is basically the, good, the deal that used to be made, you know, a minimum guarantee and I'm going to go and release your film and do the best I can. It still exists. There are houses that specialize in horror in France. There's, you know, same in Germany and all that. So, so don't, don't despair. There is, remember the way I started this entire thing by saying there's a, fi there, there's a finite amount of buyers in the world. But there's a lot of buyers that might, you know, specialize in your genre and might, you know, might buy it. Hmm. Now, is it is it in in terms of that? I mean, does it seem like that's where where you're going to end up recouping a lot of the money is internationally? Because it sounds yes. like we're talking a lot of internationally, yes. but we're not, yes. but domestically, yes. it doesn't seem yeah. like there's as many options. Listen, in general, whether you're talking about uh, 
well, I'm pushing it maybe, but I don't care. Uh, even the tentpole movies, you know, the Guardians of the Galaxy and all that, or, or the Transformers. Look on IMDb, have fun with that. It's worth it. 25, 30 years ago, the total revenue from uh, worldwide for a film, an American film, 70% would come from the US, 30% would come from the foreign marketplace, which is the rest of the world. Today, you flip it, Brad. Today, is the, it's 70% from the rest of the world, 30% from the US as a global and vague formula. But have fun with it. Just go and see the box office totals on IMDb on some of the biggest films. You're going to see where the money is made. You're going you're gonna to be like, wow, on box office. The power of just, outside of the US. I was just going to jump in. I've been speaking with a film company today from Mongolia, which is out of all the sort of places because they were, they're making their own content, but they're also looking for foreign content to push out to. So they're sort of producers, distributors. Um, as you say, it's so many different places now when it's in across the world that are little say, distributors that are looking to get content for their communities, as it were. I got some films that are available from Mongolia. Maybe they can give me $50. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> does anyone thing, recommend markets anymore? Like, does anyone, do, do you guys oh, recommend any of the markets? Or? Huge, wow. Oh, this, ooh, don't, ooh, oh, that's a huge question. I don't know if we have time on that. <laughs> oh, wow. I'd say we talk about it later because that's a big, that's a All big right. question, Brad. You're, the, you're, you're good, man. A big that is a huge question. But you cannot, I, I, I don't even want to get into it. Well, let's kick off that one as the first question next week then. That'd be good to yeah, go through. Yeah. So Jason, do you want to explain, Dan, Jason, um, if people have understood what we're trying to do with the Pitch Fest? We can. I just want to jump in and say something quickly, which you guys have hit upon and I see. So I actually spent a lot of today on different streaming sites. Social media channels for your film cost nothing, but I think every independent film should have your social media platforms, whether it's Instagram, uh, you want to be doing behind the scenes shots. So then you've got content to put out. There are a few of our audience will know while Steve and I aren't running festivals at the minute, we're doing podcasts and I'm just promoting different bits of content to keep people engaged. Um, I was on a streaming site today and one of the bits of artwork and it's psychological. I was looking at about 50 different pieces of key art on this library. One of them stood out to me because that film had also plastered itself all across Twitter. I'm part of a few Facebook groups they're engaging. What poster looks great? It stuck in my mind. It was the one that stuck out to me. I know Uwe in this call. He's got radicalization of Jeff Boyd. He's got a Twitter page. I see it. He interacts with us. You need to just have a page for yeah. every film you've got because all of a sudden, if you're going to drive traffic, as you were saying, Brad, on these revenue shares, it's such a busy place. You need to have good key art, which stands out, and you need to get people's opinions on it, but you need to have pages. And if, even if it is quick behind the scenes or something i see it and it's what will set you apart from the thousands of films that are on these catalogs netflix is a prime example you scroll through them but as soon as you see something go oh i saw that on instagram or i saw that on twitter it psychologically pulls you towards it you give it a watch and that's how some people are making their money that's sort of an insight from what i see social media for your film is fundamental and Dan, it's interesting what you just said, because, because look at it. We're in 2020. Now, filmmakers by themselves, self-distributing, are having the same job as the major, major, biggest Hollywood studios in the 1920s. They, they're doing the same work, which is, you know, <laughs> key art, poster, who is in the movie, everything. It's just so strange, you know? It's just, as it, you know, it's the same work, it's the same work, but, you know, done now by the filmmaker with tools that, of course, never existed before. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity, but at the same time, the democratization of uh, the internet makes, makes your film one out of a billion. That's a problem. So you're right, Dan. you got to stand out somewhere. You get, we are all a brand. If you're a filmmaker, you're a brand. you got to think of yourself like that. You, you're promoting all the time, um, collecting emails and from the from your first film and can continue that like Brad you know he's got a following for a horror film that he's that he's done so uh, you know if you can release information and 
keep staying in, in, in out there with, through social media, through press releases, things like that, because you, you want as many eyeballs as possible. Definitely. It builds sort of a, a rush. I think I said for another week, there's a film which I personally didn't think was great. They had 150,000 followers. They are posting everything on Twitter. As go. soon as the film, all of a sudden they got to turn around and go, oh, the film's now available here. And that little built-in audience, even if it was... 10%, even if it was 5% of that, the following, people are going to go and see it and it gives you the opportunity to recoup some of your costs and sort of build a bit of momentum, which it's all about. So with projects in mind, um, Jean-Francois, you'll let everyone know what the plan is for the next uh, few weeks. We're going to look to do something a bit more interactive with regards to yeah, pitches. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um... Jason, you want to you want to uh, you want to e explain a little bit the pitch fest thing we want to do? Yeah, so we so what we're we want to since we have a lot of filmmakers on the call and everyone's got their own projects, we thought that it would be interesting to and and this is how we got to find out how if, how people are um, if they're comfortable discussing yeah. in an open format potentially their projects, but but. You know, I, I feel like it's, it's a safe environment here to do that. And we, you know, we, we've sent out different things that people, that people need to do, uh, treatment, log line, and we're just going to go through and give feedback on these, these um, on the Pitch Fest Live for people and kind of go over them together, give our feedback, and, and we can use the community here to, if, if, if people have other ideas, to help, um, you know, it, it, to to add to the package and that's what that's what we want to do but but uh, right now and we're doing them in order so we have two we have two um we have two pitch fest packages so far yeah we have one called uh, bender that was the first email we received and number two in second position is uwi uwi is the uh, next <laughs> So we thought so we thought it would be fun for people that have projects that they wanted to develop further, and we could talk about the creative process. You know, we just uh, need so to get yeah, we just need to get an email with uh, title, genre, uh, you know, proposed budget, maybe a wish list, uh, and a very very short synopsis of uh, what it is about, and if it's a feature film, so the documentary, you know, all that stuff. And that's enough for us to, uh, to start a conversation, which I think could be very interesting. And on top of that, uh, as we, st we will start next week, Jason and I will not review, for example, what uh, Joe sent with Bender, and we will not review what Uwe sent. We will, we will open, we'll open what he sent live during the Zoom. So it's, a, you know, it's kind of a, li a live pitch. You know what I mean? So we're not going to do some studying, uh, Uwe. We're going to okay. uh, give you our first initial reaction. Then, okay. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, and it's going to be the true media company style, so it could be brutally honest. So uh, yeah, <laughs> everyone's got those those lovely projects. But with regards to that information, I know we've got a few um, new people that have joined us. If they, I can provide a list, and I'm going to be putting it on our social media. Um, I think I emailed a few of you, so you had that first. I, we don't know how busy this might be. We've got a nice yeah, little community gonna, here. Um, we're going to get a Zoom email out with all the details. Yep, and yeah. I'll be putting it on the Fusion International Film Festival Facebook um, page and link to it on Twitter just so people can see. I, I know Brad and I think Gita, Robin, I think you had that in an email that I sent out yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we'll just gauge the interest of this. It could well be that this ties us up until Christmas. Who knows? 